You know, here at Centers for Spiritual Living, we have seven core values that guide what we do. We like to focus on a different core value each week. Those seven core values are love, healing, oneness, abundance, spiritual growth, service, and diversity. And today we're focusing on spiritual growth. And as I was thinking about spiritual growth, I was reminded of what one of my earliest teachers said about spiritual growth. He said, you know, spiritual growth rarely announces itself. We would like to think that an experience of spiritual growth will be heralded by a parting of the clouds and the light shining down and the angelic chorus saying, you are about to grow, right? It doesn't happen that way. Most of the time, spiritual growth happens so incrementally that it's easy to miss until we're willing to take the time to step back, to reflect, to look at where we were in life six months ago, a year ago, maybe even just last week, and acknowledge all of the change and the growth that we have had. For if we're committed to a spiritual practice, if we are truly committed to our own spiritual growth, then it will happen bit by bit, day by day, and when we stop and look back, we can celebrate all of the growth that we have had over the course of time. And that celebration will not only anchor the spiritual growth that we're observing, but help to fuel us forward in even greater expressions of growth and love and life. So for all the ways that you are growing spiritually, whether you see them or not, whether you've recognized them yet or not, they are there, and I celebrate them and celebrate you in all of your spiritual magnificence. Thank you. You know, CSL is not just here in South Florida. CSL is part of a global organization with over 500 centers worldwide. And we're a spiritual community that honors all religions and all faiths. We know there is no wrong way to worship. Whether you're lighting a candle, repeating a mantra, or saying a prayer, we respect and honor any way that draws us closer to spirit. And so today, we celebrate the diversity in religious practices with our ceremony the flames of faith. This candle is lit for the Tao to honor the universal path of harmony, the natural way. This candle is lit for the shamanic traditions, honoring the belief and practices of all indigenous peoples. This candle is lit for Hinduism to honor the spiritual path of devotion and the variety of religious icons and deities. This candle is lit for Judaism, to honor the path of sacred law. This candle is lit for Buddhism, to honor the four noble truths and the way of compassion. This candle is lit for Christianity, to honor the Christ consciousness that lives in all of us. The candle is lit for Islam, to honor the path of peaceful submission to the will of God. The candle is lit for the universalistic religion of Baha'i to honor the path of unity. This candle is lit for our own faith, New Thought, to honor the metaphysical path and practice of universal spiritual principles. And finally, the tenth candle is lit for peace and for the peaceful acceptance of all faiths and spiritual practices worldwide. Uh, you know, for those of you I've never met, I'm Reverend Ben, I'm the Associate Minister here, and I am really, really excited about today. Uh, I'm very excited about today because we have a very special guest speaker to share with you today. There's a lot of things that I could say about this woman to introduce her to you. I could tell you that she had CSL Fort Lauderdale as a home church before she moved to Kansas City and became a pillar of the CSL Kansas City community, helping it to be an amazing, wonderful, safe place for so many people. I could tell you how she lives her spiritual practice, not just at her center or her home, but publicly, in her public life, in such a way that is an inspiration to me and so many others. I could tell you lots of things about Kate Gimbelow, but the best way for me to let you know the magnificence of this woman is to have you spend as much time with her consciousness as possible. So please welcome, join me in welcoming our guest speaker for the day, the amazing Kate Gimbelow. Love you. Thank you. Wow, that's hard to follow up. So yes, as Ben mentioned, this is my home church. 
This is the space, not the literal space, but the metaphysical space that saved my life when my life fell apart. So I came to this teaching 19 years ago with Dr. Arlene Bump at the old building. <laughs> yep. My wife and I actually, for our 15th anniversary, were married in that church by Dr. Arlene, had the whole ceremony, the whole thing, even though it wasn't, you know, legal per the government. And uh, I'm so excited that I'm back in Fort Lauderdale with my wife uh, and our son, who's 14, to celebrate our 30th anniversary. And I have to tell you, that would not have been possible had I not stumbled across stumbled across CSL in the way that we all seem to. So when Ben and Sherry came here, of course, Dr. Chris came from Kansas City, so he's one of my spiritual um, growth partners who has changed my life. My Jeannie and my Ross came, my Jim Wood came, like you guys are taking all the best of us <laughs> from Kansas City. But what's awesome is when I come home, I'm not just coming home to the church, I'm coming home to family. And so I feel very welcome, I'm so excited. And listen, to be asked, to talk about the subject of an awakening spirit, you know, that really sets me on fire. Um, because I think of my life as having been written in two big books. The first was before I came to CSL, before I started my own awakening. That is a book filled with chapter after chapter of abuse and dysfunction and sexual abuse and lots of not good stuff that happens to us in the human experience. And then I have the book after having started to awaken and now having grown through that awakening and gotten to the point of living a fearless life, a full, abundant life where I absolutely know no fear, where my life is filled with joy and only joy. So what is an awakening? You know, I, I'm a big learner. I love, I'm a lifelong learner. I always go to the books when I have questions. And I, I went to the dictionary because I know what an awakening is, but I thought it interesting that one of them is an adjective, and it says to describe something coming into awareness. So it's an, an awakening, but it's really an awareness, and that awareness in a spiritual sense is when you start to become aware of the universe and that you are in direct connection to everything in the universe, that you are not separate, that you are one with all of life's force. As human beings, we generally identify ourselves exclusively with what is called the ego, psychologically the ego. It's we see and represent ourselves by all the things that make us unique. I'm a white woman. I love sushi. I'm a mother. I'm an activist. Right? These are all ways in which the ego qualifies and quantifies who we are. But when we become awakened beings, when we start becoming aware, we begin, we begin to see our true identity, that we recognize that we are connected to this spiritual divine dimension of pure awareness, pure being, pure love, God, spirit, universe. You put the name to it, there are many. It's being awakened when it means realizing that our psyche isn't part of a greater whole, it is the greater whole, right? We're not a division, we are. When you start being simultaneously aware of your individual self and the connection between that and everything else, that is the awakening, that is the awareness. I love that Deepak Chopra says that if you think of it as a wave in the ocean, you begin to become aware that you are the wave and you are the ocean. I like that. That awareness, that tingling, little tingling back there of knowing the truth is what leads to the awakening, awareness to awakening, because you're discovering an enlightened sense of consciousness. And it is a journey. That acknowledgement, the first step, that acknowledgement of our connection to something greater can come in many different ways. And I, I'm guessing one of these is your story. It can be through a traumatic experience, something profound, detrimental, impactful to the physical or emotional well-being. Think of an accident that's being suffered or abuse or, you know, something really severe that some of us go through. 
We often hear stories of people who have had a near-death experience, right? And they go through something that begins to make them aware that there is something bigger out there, something greater. This awareness leading to the awakening can be brought on by a major life change, a divorce, the loss of someone that you love. Then there's my personal experience, existential crisis. That's a good one. That moment when life shows up for you in such a way that you really lose track of the purpose of life. It's often accompanied by depression and self-destructive behaviors and doubt as to why, are my, why am I here? What am I meant to do? We believe that there's no hope for a life that is any different than the one that we're living. Existential. And last, there's the natural awakening. This is the one I wish I had had. This is the one that comes from those of you who show up in a place like this and take on practices at, with the want and the desire to grow, meditation, mindfulness. I've had, had certainly my own natural awakening once I went through the trauma that I did to come here. And I have found such amazing, I talk about the tools in my tool belt that are made up of that, right? And they're the ones that I pull out whenever I want, that self-transformational Thing that you do that helps you find your way in the world. For me, my biggest one was radical forgiveness. If you're in the early stages of the awakening, if you've become aware and you're really growing and you're, and you're tapping into the belief, the desire to know that you are truly all-powerful, all one with spirit, I want to make you aware and say it's okay to know that when we go through this, most of us return back to ego <laughs> over and over again. We keep going back to that physical thing because th that, that idea that you are all powerful, it takes a while to get your head around that. We're, you're, we're human beings. We're having a human experience, but what we really are is spiritual beings having a human experience. But all those human messages come to us that you can't be all that. But what I like to say to people, as soon as that awareness starts to happen, you can't put that genie back in the bottle, no matter how you try. And I've tried. You can ignore him. You can look away. But it's like trying to pin down a cloud to try to make that go away and put those truths back into that bottle. You know, it's funny because I have the opportunity because I'm surrounded by this amazing tribe of people who believe different things than me and do different things than me and exist differently than I do because I show up and embrace diversity. I have amazing conversations about this idea of becoming aware of the one, embracing the fact that we are one. I have a lot of people who are in other faiths who can see themselves as having been created by God and in God's image, but that idea of being imbued with God's spirit within is a lot for some people to handle. So I don't know uh, if Dr. Crystal does this, but I always loved when I would go to his talks is how often he'd go back into science, right? He still do this, pull up neuroscience things to help find your way, and I love that, and I've kind of stolen that from him. So um, I, I dug into science, and this is what I love to share with people. So if you are on that path to awareness, and you're having trouble really grasping that you are the one, that you are God, you are all-powerful, you are, you are all there is, as is everyone else around you, come with me on this trip through science. So you have 100 trillion cells in your body, 100 trillion, and each of those cells has billions of atoms. We all know about atoms. And imagine that those cells and those atoms can be further divided as you go deeper into subatomic particles. And you can go deeper into those and divide those, and there are even more subatomic particles. All the way down, science is now finding, there is an infinite number of subatomic particles making up who you are. Science is proving that your physical body has an infinite nature. There's a concept in quantum physics, it's called the Higgs boson, but unofficially, scientists call it the God particle. It refers to the smallest division that the universe creates. 
So originally we had microscopes, right? And we could see that there were cells. And we thought that was it. That was the smallest particle. It's never going to get smaller than that. And then we grew new lenses. We developed new things and we saw deeper and deeper. Every time that we had a new lens, we were able to see more infinitely into it. Now we've gone all the way down to quarks. My 14-year-old taught me about a quark. Odd. So every time that we go deeper and deeper, we find that infinity is within us just as the universe is infinite, right? So if all things in the universe are infinite, including each of us, this building, this body, this everything around us is infinite and little bitty particles, what is holding it all together? What's the glue that keeps you from just disintegrating into a bunch of little subatomic particles? The answer is space. This is the God particle. Here's the thing, at the smallest level, there is space between those smallest little particles. Just as there is space between galaxies and stars and planets and cells and atoms. Even the structure of the atom is made of 99.99999% space. So the reality is that we live mostly in space. The whole material world around you including your body, is 0.000001% solid. 0.000001% solid is all this is. And yet we spend 100% of our time paying attention to that 0.000001%, don't we? Now that's ego. We have this sense of separation from each other because we focus on those boundaries that separate us, that differentiate us from each other. Color, age, nationality, religion, political beliefs, all those things that we focus on, that 0.000001%. It's easier to accept that the universe is infinite in its space because of the scale that is bigger than us. But when you omit the scale, you see that we replicate that balance of matter and space. You see, we are each of us a small universe. Okay, so we're more space than matter. Science has proven that. That space is comprised of the other, energy, thought, consciousness, spirit, whatever you want to call it, that God particle. So how does that then connect all of us? How are we all not just individual universes? There's an experiment called 101 Dalmatians. I love scientists have good senses of humor. The premise is that we are connected to everyone and everything through an invisible field of intelligence and energy. In quantum speak, quantum scientists tell us that this lattice of connections is called entanglement. And entanglement shows up for us in synchronicity, right? That phenomena where we feel like we've lived a moment, that we've connected with a stranger with whom we've never met, but we feel like we know them. We walk around going, wow, that was a weird coincidence. But get this, scientists say that that is proof of the interconnectivity of all things. Because here's the thing about us, we humans. We walk around as a house for a brain. That's all this is. It's just carrying the brain around, you know? That brain is the thing that drives the body to do all things. It keeps the whole system running. And here's what's amazing. The human body is sending to the brain 11 million bits per second of information. 11 million bits per second. And the conscious mind is only able to process about 50 bits per second. So 50 out of 11 million is what the conscious mind is dealing with. So there is something bigger and stronger energy at work within us. You know, if you held a human brain in your hand, it'd be sort of this mushy, soggy mess. Little putty, you know, weighs in at about 2.9 pounds. So if you weigh 150 pounds, your brain is only 2% of your body weight. So how is it possible that this soggy mess, this little gray, soggy stuff, can give rise to the richness and depth of your conscious experience? Consider this, because this is what science is proving out. What the brain does not do is produce consciousness. What it does is it acts as a receiver, which picks up the fundamental consciousness that is all around us, and then it transmits it into our being. 
you understand? Science is proving that this is just a receiver for everything that is going on around us that is then interpreting it into our being. The human brain is so sophisticated and complex, it can receive and transmit consciousness in a very intense and intricate way, that this signal is throughout the entire universe and presenting itself to every receiver, every human being. That is the one. That is the one consciousness that science is proving. This interconnected signal is then what is connecting us on a level that we can't see or necessarily articulate. But it makes sense when you consider that 10,999,950 bits is what the brain is processing every second. Right now, in that second, you did it. That is a powerful energy, friends. That is thought, that is spirit flowing through each of us that compels us to find the connections and recognize the truth of our oneness. All right, so that's the brain, that's the energy, that's the transmitter, receiver, I'm on it, right? We all get that, we're all connected. But then what about this physical thing? You can't ignore that even though it's only 0.000001% solid, we're still really different from each other, right? How can we look past the obvious physical differences? Because on the surface, there are some major ones. There are actually more than three million differences in your genome than anyone else in the entire world ever in history. That sounds huge, three million. But on the other hand, we are all of us 99.9% the same DNA-wise. So you literally are 99.9% .9 the same as Joan of Arc, Martin Luther King, your next door neighbor, Cleopatra, you name it, Jody Foster. <laughs> what <Whatever. laughs> But you are also, get this, 99% the same DNA-wise as our closest relative, the chimpanzee. You see, we are each of us made up of stardust. Literally 93% of your physical existence is stardust. All of us are. So long ago, someone may have made a wish upon a star and it was you. We are all made of the same space particles. So between the shared stardust particles, the DNA, and the shared space of energy, we have this connective tissue that makes us all conjoined twins with every other being on every level. So what's great about that, friends, is that you are never alone even when you feel lonely, you are never alone. You are one with the universe. You are one with each of us. So I love the quote that says, if you wonder if you're having a spiritual awakening, you probably are. That genie is out of the bottle. And I think I just took the cap off uh, to really let him out. So where are you on that journey? Because you can quantify it. I like to break things down. Let me give you the five steps of awakening and see where you recognize, where are you? The first is the initiation, okay? This is the onset of spiritual awakening. You may encounter inner turmoil, a sense of feeling disconnected from the world through one of those ways I talked about, something tragic, some existential crisis. It comes from the awareness of the ego not being who you are. You start to realize there's something more, there has to be something more than this. It's that period of time when you start to acknowledge a greater energy as at work within the universe. And during that time, you feel this call to look inward and begin the process of self-evaluation. You may have gone through life on autopilot until this point, until that initiation, but you've started asking yourself those questions. Why do I drink so much? Why do I get angry so often? Why am I always comparing myself to others? Why do I attract so much drama? Whatever those questions are, that is the initiation. You feel the draw to change. You then move to the query. This is that acknowledgement of there being something more that opens your eyes to the areas of your life in need of healing. You move into a period of questioning your life as you confront limiting beliefs and the negative chatter, negative behavioral patterns, the negative, all those things that are back there. You begin to question the attachments that you have in life. 
Attachments are how you've defined yourself, right? Maybe you define yourself by the job that you have and now you've lost it or the education that you've achieved but you can't find the right job or the partner you chose but they keep cheating on you or what you eat or where you travel, who you vote for, whatever those things are that you've identified yourself through them and in the query you start to think, but wait, who am I really? Who am I beyond that? Once you do that, you move to the quest. It's my favorite, the quest. I love that word. You begin to inquire about spiritual practice as a means to gain a sense of divine wisdom, to deepen your understanding of this world. Whatever that is for you, meditation, walking outside, whatever it is to come to center, to find the way that leads you to your answer, the quest. And once you've started doing that, you get to integration. Ah, oh, it's a magnificent period, this integration. When you start doing that spiritually awakening journey, the light is shed on the wounds of your soul that have been put there by this human experience. And as those wounds are revealed, you feel compelled to seek support through traditional therapy, through spiritual guidance, through coaching, spiritual healing. I did them all at once when I hit that point. Two years solid, I did them all. Radical forgiveness, 365 nights in a row. That's a painful experience. Just keep ripping those things open because that's what you've got to do with an internal wound, you see. You cannot bandage it. You must tear it open and look inside and you must reach in and take out the core pain and identify it. And that's how integration begins to happen because you begin to realize that your value is way beyond the education, the job, the good, all the things. Because when you are one with spirit, when you realize that you are imbued with God, you know that it is time to integrate that into every aspect of your life. And that, my friends, leads to the last step, the nirvana, oneness, oneness with the universe. That final step when you truly know, truly know, without a doubt, you have lost any sense of separateness from the universe and you identify only with the imbued oneness within you. And what is waiting for you, if you have not yet gotten to that point in the journey, is fearlessness. And Dr. Chris gave me the gift of fearlessness. He was my teacher for that. I have not lived a moment of fear in four years. It is a remarkable experience. So what are the signs? What are you going to see along the way? I don't want you to slough these off, okay? As you go down this journey, one is intuition. You know, like when you think about an old friend and then you bump into them at Disneyland. Oh, wow, that's odd. When the phone rings and you know it's your best friend from college. Have you ever felt that moment when you meet someone that you already know them? That it, it, like it's so natural. Those are the signs of intuition. Thoughts, objects, individuals, they all have energy. And spiritually awoken people tap into that more than those who have not yet taken that journey. So as you become more aware, as you move towards oneness, you will find that happens more and more and more. As Dr. Chris says, it's not out of the blue. Synchronicity. That's that feeling that the universe gives you when you feel like something's going to happen, right? You think about moving to San Juan, and then you meet a new friend who grew up in San Juan, and then your current job sends you on a business trip to San Juan, right? We had those things happen where you're like, wow, that's really weird. What a coincidence. No, not. Synchronicity will show up more and more. You move to increased compassion. You may find yourself suddenly being more overwhelmed by what is going on around you. Because you see, my friends, it's one thing to watch life happen. It's another when you realize that whatever is happening is happening to you. It's powerful. Don't shy away from that. Lean into that. It is one of the greatest gifts I think this teaching gives us is it moves you beyond empathy. It moves you beyond compassion. It moves you into being with that person or that group of people or that animal or the planet or whatever those messages are. Lean into it. You will find your power and grace there. No fear of death. Huge. Imagine that. I couldn't have imagined it. 
until I was 51 years old. I could never have imagined living with no fear. It is the most remarkable gift you can give yourselves. Authenticity. That's a good one. I am authentically who I am. I do not try to be anyone else ever. I do not compare myself to anyone. I love this whole bag of bones, the whole thing. I love her. She is one of my favorite people to spend time with, that Kate Gimbelo. And she cooks a mean meal. It's amazing because when you are authentic, you realize you have nothing to prove to anyone because they're perfect and so are you. But I want you to understand this. Life is messy. The human experience is a messy one. Challenges will arise, pain will confront you, loss will gut you, and they will want to pull you back toward ego, to the safety of, gosh, it just keeps happening to me. Because when you become aware, when you become one with the universe, there is no victimhood. And that's a big girl, big boy idea. You gotta pull up your big girl panties when you realize no one is ever doing anything to you. You are one with it and you are there to learn a lesson. As Eckhart Tolle says, you find peace not by rearranging the circumstances of your life, but by realizing who you are at the deepest level. And at the deepest level, my friends, you are space, you are stardust. You are energy connected to a source and all other living things. And being here today tells me that you are also an awakening spirit. So stay the course. What waits for you on the other side is pure love, fearlessness, and unbelievable joy. Namaste. So we have an opportunity now after that amazing bath of love, of consciousness, to venture within to that space, to that space that connects us, to that space that is us. And so I invite you to find yourself comfortable in your chair, allow your eyes to close, and let the music bring your attention within. Focus on your heart center. Simply breathe. Simply allow the universe to breathe you. The space. That infinite space. Wherein there is peace. Wherein there is love. Wherein there is spirit. Breathe into that space. Simply breathe in, allowing every in-breath to expand your experience of this infinite space. These underlying arms of the universe holding you, encompassing you, filling you with peace, presence, oneness. As you continue to breathe into this infinite space, recognize that in its infinite nature it is the same space we all are in, the same space we all are enjoying, the same underlying arms supporting every one of us. 
and in this practice of meditation, of silence, of stillness, allow yourself to be encompassed by that infinite love and that infinite space for a moment in the silence. Knowing this space is inherent in who we are, this infinite space, stillness, peace, compassion, love, joy, connection, oneness. I know we can return at any time to this place, find connection in this place, be loved and healed, grown and supported through these underlying arms. It is in gratitude for this truth that I breathe into this moment and allow that breath coming into my body to bring my awareness back to the point zero, 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 one percent. Grateful for the point zero, 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 one percent. Breathing into this moment yet again, my awareness shifts back into the room. Allow your fingers to wiggle, your toes to wiggle. And when you are ready, allow your eyes to open and be here now. So we like to finish with an affirmation and a prayer. You've got an affirmation card. Looks just like this. We'll get that up on the screen as well. So let's affirm together. Daily, I awaken to my spiritual nature of love, compassion, and joy. And turning our attention within once again to that space, to that infinite, magnificent, powerful space, that space within us that is us, that life itself expressing as us. And in the oneness of the space, in the oneness of life, what I know is that that life, that infinite expression of wisdom and love that birthed the entire universe is guiding every single one of us throughout this week and every moment of our lives, that as life itself is an expression of joy, peace, grace, ease, abundance, and love, that all of these qualities and more are available to us in every moment, and in every moment we access them and allow them to flow into our experience, serving ourselves and the world in gratitude for all of the good that already is, all of the good that is yet to be, all of the good that is mine I don't even know yet. I give my thanks for this magnificence of life and allow it to be. And in gratitude, say thank you, Spirit. And so it is. Thank you so much for joining us. We will be back again next Sunday, 10.30 Eastern Time, in the house and live on Facebook Live. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful Sunday. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching, and thanks for supporting CSL. If you'd like to know more about us, check us out on our website or social media. Blessings.